And let's be turning to 1 Corinthians this morning. And we need to step into the seventh chapter. And we're going to be talking about marriage for the next couple of weeks. And so I'm looking for those people who have perfect marriages. And uh, so we can get a few photographs and things like that that we can post up on the screens while we're talking about marriage, you know, just to use you as examples to the rest of us. And uh, I know there's some of y'all out there. And so uh, we'll just be looking for you. Send me an email, you know. Have we? Oh, I thought, is Philip going to stand up and testify over there? All right. It's working already. We hadn't even read the passage yet. <laughs> Having marriages renewed this morning. <laughs> I guess uh, marriage is one of those things in our culture and society in our country today that uh, is been tossed around. It's one of those things that people are trying to redefine to make it fit them and their situation. And uh, it can be kind of a touchy topic at times to talk about marriage. And so we're going to be walking on some coals, I guess, for the next two weeks. But we're going to see what the scripture has to say about marriage. And uh, that's where we're going to have to start. And that's where we're going to have to stop with what scripture says. So I want us to look this morning at the seventh chapter. Uh, we didn't give you anything to put beside Numbers 1, 2, and 3 this morning uh, because we felt like you would want to write in your own notes this morning and you would want to see what the Holy Spirit said to you. I want us to read the first nine verses this morning and then we will step back and, and try to break them down a little bit for you. He begins in verse 1 by saying, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. That's kind of been the motto of every father to his teenage son and vice versa to his teenage daughter. Don't touch each other. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. And come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. For I wish that all men were even as I myself. But each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. But I say to the unmarried and to the widows... It is good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. In these few chapters in here, Paul is responding to a letter that the Corinthian church sent him. If you'll back up to verse number one with me. And look at what he has to say. He says, now concerning the things of which you wrote to me. So we understand from this first letter that the church at Corinth had some problems. And they did what people do. They wrote a letter and they sent it off to Paul. And they said, Paul, we have these struggles and these problems in our church. And could you give us some advice? Could you tell us what we needed to do? And so Paul is responding to some specific questions. 
Now, I think we need to understand that this morning, that Paul is not giving us the encyclopedia on marriage in this chapter. He's not covering every base and every nuance of marriage. We need to understand he has been asked some questions, and he is responding to those questions. And he's telling them what Jesus had to say. And he's also telling them what God is telling him to write back to them. So I say that, that if you're going to write a book on marriage and how to have the happy life, that you need more than just the seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians. Because the Bible in its entirety speaks to the idea of marriage, the fact that God created it, and so forth. And so we do not need to get everything that we know about marriage from one chapter. We need to hear what he has to say. But now the specific areas that Paul is going to be addressing here, we need to listen to what God is saying to us through those passages. Now, it goes without saying, we're not going to raise any hands or anything this morning. But everybody at some time in their married life has been a little bit disgruntled. You can grunt with me if you want to. You don't have to say amen out loud. But you can kind of, uh, yeah. I don't honor the pew, huh? Yeah, brother, I know where you're coming from. Type thing. Because a marriage is a relationship. And relationships change or, or there's factors that come into them and you have to adjust to those relationships. But marriage is a relationship. And so it is not just a velvet carpet that rolls out in front of us and we don't put any effort in it at all and it's just hunkadory all of our lives. It's just not. You know that. I don't have to tell you that this morning. You're sitting there going, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't agree with my spouse last night, but I ate the meal anyway and went on to bed. Uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of the way it goes. I'm wanting to tear down some walls this morning for you. I'm wanting to tear down some walls that we have built up because marriage has become one of those things that we have greatly criticized people over. And, and uh, we're not here to be criticizing anybody this morning. We're here to hear what God has to say. Now he begins by saying that it is good for a man not to touch a woman. That is Paul's basic statement here. <laughs> he said if you want to avoid all of the conflict and all of the struggles and all of the trials, he said then you just need to be celibate. Celibate. Now, that's not a term that we throw out a lot this day and time uh, because people just, uh, you know, we, that's not what a lot of people think of when they think of, of living this life, of being single in this life. But Paul is a man who is single. And he is saying to people, for me, the best thing for my life is for me to be wifeless, for me to be childless. It's better off in my calling and my ministry for me to just be a man who is celibate. And we could stop right there and forget the rest of the chapter, uh, but it doesn't work, does it? We need to hear the rest of the story. And Paul is going to talk in this chapter, and I need you to understand this, he's going to refer to us in places of Christians being married to Christians, in places, he's going to talk about Christians that are married to non-Christians. And he's going to talk more about people that are just single, that have never married. But he says, if you wanted just a black and white blanket statement, then it would be better off if a man and a woman just never touched. Now, I realize that the human race would come to an end pretty quickly that way. But maybe that's what Paul was thinking. The Lord's going to come back anyway. Let's just go ahead and bring the population down to just a small number. But he said, if you, in all honesty, he said that would just be the, the, the black and white answer. Just don't touch anybody. 
Well, you and I both know that's not going to happen for most people unless they've been called to it. So he gives us verse 2, and he gives us the word, nevertheless. And he's going to give us two views in this next couple of verses. He says, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, he said, because people are, men and women are having relationships with one another, he says, let each man have his own wife and let each woman have her own husband. Paul said the first view is that I don't think that you're going to live your entire life and never touch somebody else, especially somebody of the opposite sex. He said, I, I can see Paul taking a step back and saying, I really just don't see you having that much self-control. So my best answer for you in this case is that it's better off to be married than not to be married. It's better off for you to have a spouse than to not have one at all and to go around committing sexual immorality. He says it's better off for you to be married. Now, he doesn't say it's better off for you to have a, a perfect marriage or something like that because we've already understood that we haven't seen one. But he says it's better off to be in a marriage relationship so that the physical desires that we have can be under control and can be confined to one person than it is to not be married and to sleep with whomever may come down the road today. So Paul is addressing marriage with the understanding that God gave it to man and he gave it to woman and it does keep us from committing sin. And the sin here is sexual immorality. So first of all, the first view is that Paul sees it as a deterrent to sin. For you men and women that are married this morning, part of your marriage is that it keeps you from sexual immorality. I don't know if you, I don't think the preacher probably told you that when you were standing there at the altar and he said, do you take this woman? You probably didn't say, yeah, she's going to keep me from sexual immorality. Let's get married. You, know. you probably didn't say things like that. But you hadn't read 1 Corinthians chapter 7 either. But it keeps us from sin. A marriage keeps us from committing sexual sins that tear a society apart and break us down. I'm wanting you to understand this morning that marriage is a good thing. Marriage is a good thing. I don't care if your toast was burned this morning or not. Marriage is a good thing. God instituted it. God created it. God created man and woman. God put them together. And it is a relationship. And it is a growing relationship. And it will grow the whole time that you are married. But it is a good thing. Because first of all, it keeps us from sinning. You can mark that one down. And we can move ahead. Paul is very straightforward in these verses. Now... He then says in verse 3, to add to that, he says that this marriage is not a dominant relationship. Have you ever had a friend that dominated you so much you wish you didn't have them as a friend? Well, marriage can be that way if one dominates the other to the point that they're basically a, one's a slave and the other one's a master. He says in verse 3, let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. Well, preacher, I just really don't feel like it today. Well, we come to the second part here. Marriage is not about what you feel like sometimes. Marriage is about the relationship with the other person and doing for them what they need. Well, preacher, I thought marriage was all about me. <laughs> well, you've learned this morning that it's not. So just mark that off your list there, and we'll try to correct you. But marriage is a relationship, and it is a humbling relationship. It is a submissive relationship. It is two people submitting to one another to live together in the same house, and sometimes that can be a struggle. 
But two people submitting to share a bank account, two people submitting to share their lives together, it is a great humbling. And he uses this terminology of render. We give ourselves away in a marriage one to the other. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. Well, preacher, what if one person does all of the rendering? Then it's going to be a hard road to walk. I'm, being, I'm not being joking with you. I'm being flat out honest with you. If one person does all of the giving, all of the submitting, all of the surrendering, all of the giving of themselves, and the other one does not, it's going to be a hard road. I'll just be up front with you. The scripture says that it is an action that is reciprocated, that each one, not based on how much the other one gives. Now, this is not one of them things, well, honey, if you give me that diamond earrings I'm wanted, then I'll be kind to you. This, no, we're, we're not bargaining deals here or anything. We're talking about freely giving ourselves to the other for their benefit and for their best. And that takes a lot of humility. He uses very strong language. You render to your wife the affection due her. And the wife renders to the husband the affection due him. Now we need to understand this statement based on the culture in which uh, Paul said it. We're in a culture where a woman had no rights at all, basically. And so Paul is breaking ground here. When he says that we go back to the garden and God created male and female, have created Adam and Eve, and he gave one to the other and he brought them together and they became one flesh, he is speaking of a mutual respect and a mutual giving of one another. He is placing man and woman on the same level. Now, we've dealt with this in our world ever since then. There are still countries today where women are treated basically as possessions. You get in the back seat of the car. You sit with my other five wives or something like that. And that, you know, we, we kind of shake our head at it, but it goes on around our world all the time. And Paul is lifting the man and the woman and placing them at the same height, the same place in life. And he says that you need to learn to render one to the other the affection that they need. You'll spend your lifetime in marriage doing just that. Listening to your spouse's needs, reading them, and knowing when they simply need to be left alone, and knowing when they simply need a hug. Knowing that when a word is all they need to hear to bring them out of whatever depressed mood they're in, a word is all they need to hear to encourage them to get up and do better you'll learn that criticism gets us nowhere in a marriage. It basically brings things to a halt. Criticism is not rendering affection to the other one. Criticism is tearing the other person down. And it's, it never builds a marriage. It only destroys it. So Paul speaks to them. He says, first of all, marriage is an a union created by God and it keeps us from committing sexual immorality. He said, second of all, marriage is a growing relationship in that we learn that there are other people in this world and we're not the only ones here. And that we need to work together and that working together, God accomplishes more through our lives than he does with us going our separate ways. A marriage is a very growing, struggling time. It is a time where we learn about ourselves and we learn about others. And hopefully we learn to be more like God. Now, he tells us that this is a fundamental of marriage. Now, let's look at this a little bit closer. We want to put verses 4 and 5 with this passage, with, this, with these two views that he's given us. He says that the wife, now this is extremely strong language that he uses in this next verse. And this is where we kind of want to back away and say, we live in 2016, preacher. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. 
And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Now listen to verse 5 before you jump off a cliff. <laughs> Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now we put verse 2, 3, 4, and 5 together. Please don't separate them and, and say that neither one has anything to do with the other one. It's, it's a statement all packed together. You cannot rip this apart. Remember in verse 2, he's talking about the problem with sexual immorality. People in the church at Corinth, we know what the lost people were doing, but the people in the church were sleeping with one another with people they were not married to. And the church said, well, we just can't have this. And Paul said, you're right, you can't. He said, people need to get married because marriage keeps them from sexual immorality. He said, but understand that marriage is a growing experience. It call, brings about submission. It brings about expressions of love. And he says, you need to understand that a woman gives herself to the man and the man gives himself to the woman and they each have a, a, he uses the word authority, but they each have a, 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 a kind of an ownership of one another. And he's referring to that idea of a one person in the marriage party using the, the, the sexual relationship that a marriage has as a tool to get something they want out of the other person. Well, I just have a headache tonight. But you know, if I had that ring that we looked at down there at the jewelry store, I'm sure my headache would go away. Uh, Paul, is sp he's speaking to that very thing. That, that this is not about uh, using the marriage relationship, the sexual part of it, to get something that you want out of life. He says, you give yourself to your husband. And you give yourself to your wife. And you, it is to meet their needs. It is to fulfill the desires that they have. Because you do not want this sexual immorality to pop up, to come around, to be a part of, of your life. Because it's going to tear your marriage apart. How many marriages have been ripped apart because of an unfaithful spouse? Millions. Millions, literally. All because there was something going on. Now, there's been many different uh, reasons, I know that, but one of the reasons, and this is what Paul is talking about, is where one just has no interest and no desire in the other one. And it brings about a time of detriment, of death almost, to the marriage. The relationship between the man and the woman needs to be stronger than the sexual desire. One day, as time goes along, you're going to get older and older. And you're going to be like old Abraham when God said, I want you to have a child. <laughs> he said, have you forgotten? I'm in my 90s. He said, that, none of that works anymore. <laughs> And God says, yeah, but uh, I'm God and all things are possible with me. There's going to come a time in marriage where the, the sexual part of it will no longer be a part of marriage. Simply because of age. Simply because of our bodies. It's going to happen. And what's going to hold you together then? It's going to be the relationship that you have built through the years. The friendship that holds you together. Paul says to us in this passage, the Lord is saying to us, there are times that we do restrain ourselves from that, from that sexual, that marital relationship. And he says it's when we give ourselves to fasting. It's when we give ourselves to prayer. He said, but we always come back together and we do it in a loving manner. He said, now Satan will use this in order to tempt you if you have a lack of self-control. Self-control. Marriage 
is work. That's all there is to it. Now, we watch our, our Hallmark movies, and we know that it floats through the air, and it sits upon you like pollen dust, and you just become so crazy about one another, and you live happily ever after, even after Christmas is over. I think we need to make a second uh, addition to some of these Hallmark movies and see what it looks like before Easter gets there and they're fighting over something. But I think we, we dream in our minds and we dream in our world that, that there are these perfect relationships out there and some people spend their entire life looking for these perfect relationships. These relationships are built they're built, folks. We want to talk about falling in love, and everything is just hunkadory from there on out. Marriages, good marriages, are built. And they're not built by one person. They're not held together by one person. They're a team. God said that it is not good for the man to be alone, and it's not good for a woman to be alone. He put us together. And the scripture here is agreeing with that. It is better for us to marry than it is for us to be alone. Marriage keeps us from sexual immorality. And marriage builds us in our relationships. And we're able to deal with other people based on the relationship that we have with our spouse. We're able to handle the struggles of life. We have a place to come to. We have a partner who hears us who listens to us, we have someone who cares about us. So marriage is a good thing. So if you've been debating that, Scripture is clear that it's good. Now, he doesn't stop there. I mean, he's, my goodness, he's got about 40 verses here just on, uh, on, on marriage. And so he's going to deal with a lot of s other subjects. But we're, we're going to have to take it a week at a time. But he then leaves us with verses 6, 7, 8, and 9. And he's spoken to us. I, I kind of want to look at verses 2 through 5. And, and I'm a very simple man. But I, I kind of say that it's common sense. If you show kindness to somebody, most of the time they'll show kindness back to you. And if you are willing to give and take with somebody, many times they will give and take with you. And through the process, you will grow together. And that's, those are some fundamental basic truths with a relationship with your spouse, a relationship with your children, a relationship with your boss on your job, a relationship with, at church. It's just some basic common sense truths that have to do with relationships, and marriage is a relationship. So let's pick up at number six, because now Paul is going to give us <laughs> some suggestions. Don't you love suggestions? Well, you know, <laughs> I'm not married to your spouse, but if I was you, let me suggest to you what I would do. You ever heard that? Yeah, you took it with a grain of salt too, didn't you? Verse number six. He says, but I say this as a concession, not as a commandment, a concession. Paul understands relationships. What did we just say? They're give and take in relationships until you can come around to both understanding what the truth is and, what's, and what is best. He says, but uh, I have something for you. Yeah, this sin is running rampant in your church. And he says, we need to first of all, kind of con confess some things. We need to confess that the sin is there and we need to begin to work on it. It's not going to turn around overnight. It's going to take some work. So he says to us in verse 7, he's going to make some comparisons for us. He says, I wish that all men were even as myself. We want to say, Paul, you done told us that one time, not to touch the other uh, a man or a woman, and just back off and be like you. Well, Paul says, you may not have heard me the first time, so I want to say it again. I wish that all men were even as myself. I wish that every man could say, you know, I'm just going to serve the Lord, 
and I'm going to do it without a spouse and without raising a family, and I'm just going to give myself totally to the Lord. Uh, there's been some missionaries that that worked out well for them. Uh, but it's, it's not a commandment. He says, but each one has his own gift. And he stops us here and helps us to understand that somebody that wants to live a celibate lifestyle, that it must be a gift from God. Don't go home and say, you know, I'm going to be the most spiritual person at church. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm just going to stay single, and I'll be more spiritual than all of those folks at church. You're probably going to run the risk of verse 2 up there, of still having a, an immoral lifestyle. But Paul says it is given by that God calls us. He calls us to a lifestyle of celibacy. If God has not called you to it, then I say to you, do not try to live that lifestyle. If God has not called you to preach, please try to preach. If God has not called you to the mission field, then please don't try to go to the mission field. Are we on here, Todd? To us, each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner and another in that. Now, he's going to talk about gifts in more detail when he gets to chapter 12, and we're going to find that there are those that are called to be evangelists, and there are those that are called to do this and to do that. And he says, but if God has not called you to it, and in this case, he's referring specifically to a celibate lifestyle. If God has not called you to it, then it will not work for you. You need to get married. Because if you don't get married and you've not been called to a celibate lifestyle, what's going to happen to you? At some point, you're going to fall into sexual immorality. It's just going to happen. But you have to put verse 7 and 8 together. But, he says, I say to the unmarried and to the widows, it is good for them if they remain even as I am. Paul said to these widows and these unmarried, you know, if, uh, if you're going to serve the Lord, it would be better for you if you just kind of swore off all of that stuff and just uh, gave your life to the Lord. And he's going to get over and when he's writing to Timothy and he's going to tell us there, it's not working for y'all, so you need to tell these widows, these young widows, that they need to remarry because they're beginning to commit sexual immorality. That basic truth that marriage keeps us from that sin, that sin that devastates us and belittles us so much, and he says marriage is the answer to it. You need to ask God for somebody that you love and that loves you. He says... I say to you, I wish you were just like me. He's not giving up on this, of his very first foundational statement. If you want the black and white answer, it's just better that you never touch anybody and you try to live this life. He says, but I know that's not what's going to happen to you. So he gives us verse 9. It's almost, this is the concession part of it. He says, but if they cannot exercise self-control, and let's be honest this morning, most people cannot. If they cannot exercise self-control, then let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. It is a figure of speech, this word burn, that means to glow like the embers in a fire and to just give off tremendous heat. For he says, for it, that's what's going to happen in our hearts. If we have not been called to a celibate lifestyle, we're going to burn with lust, with passion, after every person that comes along. And we're going to eventually fulfill that passion, and it's going to lead us into sexual immorality. So Paul's basic statements to us this morning when he begins to talk about the do's and don'ts of marriage, he said, if you've been called to a celibate lifestyle, then be celibate. But if you have not, then you need to marry. And the benefits of that marriage is going to be that it keeps you from sexual immorality. It's going to help you build 
the relationship aspect of your life, relationships with a spouse and with everyone else in your life. And he says it's going to be a time of you learning to serve the Lord. A time of you learning to that this marriage that you're in, that this sexual act is not all there is to marriage. I think it's one of the downfalls to marriage today that we think that all there is to marriage is the, the bedroom scene and that there's not more to it than that. And when that part of it deteriorates or is no longer as exciting as it once was or begins to wane and fall apart, we find many times that the entire marriage falls apart. Marriage is built on more than just that part of the relationship. Matter of fact, that part of the relationship is a dual function. God gave it to man and woman so that we could have children. It's the only way that it happens. He also gave it to a husband and wife that they may express their intense love for one another. So it has a dual function. God does care about us. But it's not the only part of marriage. So Paul is going to bring us up to verse 10, and he's going to start another paragraph there. He's going to delve into a different aspect of marriage at this point. But he's going to leave us right here, and, he's, and he leaves us with the understanding that marriage is a good thing. I want you to go home with that. Marriage is a good thing. If God has called you to not be married, then you need to obey him. But for the rest of us, marriage is a good thing. Marriage is work. It is a relationship. There's more to marriage than just a sexual union. There is, it is a relationship of two people who come together and give themselves, render themselves one to the other. And you will spend the rest of your life doing that and learning about it. And that is marriage at the very outset. That's the first piece of marriage. There's a lot more to come. So as we go home this week, we think about our own marriages. Is it as good as it was 10 years ago? Is the relationship any better than it was five years ago? Is this been the greatest week of your marriage? High is marriage for you. High is it? God has, is there to help you. He's there to guide you. He has basic foundational truths for you. But marriage is a relationship between two people who have come to love one another. And in that coming together, they are learning what it's like to love the Lord with all their hearts. There's a spiritual aspect to it that we're going to look at as well as a physical aspect. So you think about that marriage this week. I'm going to ask Sharon if she'll come.